Next up, we got Mr. Ballin. Mr. Ballin. This man ruined six lives in six seconds. What? That's a funny title. I ain't gonna lie. That's a hilarious title. But we got Mr. Ballin. Hey, man. I ain't write to Mr. Ballin, um, like, updated video in two weeks now. Not gonna lie. Um, so, hey. He just posted this, like, I would like, 30 seconds ago, I think. Or, like, a couple couple minutes ago. So, hey, you know what I'm saying? Back with the young Mr. Ballin. Y'all let me know. Look, if you want some more Mr. Ballin content... Um, and more scary, uh, not just scary, but you know, like, um, you know what I'm trying to say, you know what I'm saying, the scary, or, uh, what's the other words you say, like, um, crime video, you know what I'm saying, something like that, um, like this video, alright, but hey, let's see what it be time, bye. In the early morning hours of April 20- Oh my god, bro, oh my god, oh my god. This is the second time I did this now. I started a video, I don't even have my headphones on. Like, bro. Okay, bro. In the early morning hours of April 27, 2006, a phone rang inside of a home in rural Michigan. When the homeowner answered it. Whoa, this is in Michigan? Oh my God, bro. It would be in Michigan too, bro. No way. All right, bro. Now we gotta listen up, bro. Cause this is happening where my state, bro. So like of April 27, 2006, a phone rang inside of a home in rural Michigan. When the homeowner answered it, what they would hear would instantly ruin their lives. But that phone call was nothing compared to the call they got five weeks later. This story has one of the most insane plot twists we've ever covered on this channel. So make sure you stick around to the end to hear what it is. But before we get into today's story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do and we upload once a week. So if that's of interest to you, please invite the like button to come on over your house for a sleepover, but then give them a bed without pillows or blankets. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't Subscribe to Mr. Ballin. Mr. Ballin. Mr. On Wednesday, Ballin. April 26, 2006, a bright, beautiful, outgoing 18 year old named Whitney Sarek began making her way across her campus towards her lecture hall where she had a class that morning. Whitney was a freshman at Taylor University, which is an evangelical Christian liberal arts college located in Upland, Indiana. Upland is a little town that sits about two miles east of Interstate 69 and is situated right between the two much larger cities of Indianapolis and Fort Wayne. As Whitney made her way along the pathway across campus and she passed by other throngs of students hustling to their own classes, she suddenly had a pang of anxiety as she realized the end of the school year was fast approaching. And while Whitney was definitely excited to head back home to rural Gaylord, Michigan, where she was from, to spend her summer vacation, she was also kind of bummed because she would have to say bye to all of her new friends in college that she wouldn't see again until after summer break in the fall when the next school year started. Whitney had made a ton of friends over the course of her freshman year, and by and large, they were other freshmen. See, y'all, that's off topic. Y'all can skip this part if y'all want to, um, but... Bro, this is, bro, this is literally what I needed to do, bro. This is, that's okay, though, because I'm a, this next year, I'm going to start being more out. But my freshman year, bro, I was not going out and being, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, getting to know people and, you know what I'm saying? Since I'm in, like, college, you know, you make friends. You feel me? I wasn't doing that at all. I was literally, to myself, um, really just focused on YouTube, you know what I'm saying? Which is okay to a sense, to a certain degree. But at the same time, what I learned was, bro, you don't got to do that. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, stick, you know, you know, focus on YouTube, obviously, but still have fun. I wasn't, I was like saying, no, I'm not going to have fun, blah, blah, you know what I'm saying? I'm going to just stay in my room all day and, you know what I mean? Like, bro, you don't got to do that. You know what I'm saying? So my freshman year was an L, L freshman year, but it's all on my fault, though. You know what I'm saying? But it's okay, though. You know what I'm saying? I got three more years. <laughs> you feel me? Hey. 
like herself, but she did have a few friends that were upperclassmen, because early in Whitney's collegiate career, she had discovered that upperclassmen were just as friendly as freshmen, and they came with the bonus of lots of experience and expertise, and if you just asked them for guidance or advice, they'd be happy to give it to you. And so over the course of the school year, anytime Whitney had an opportunity to interact with or be around upperclassmen, she would take it, thinking, you know, maybe I can learn something. And in fact, that morning, as Whitney was making her way across campus, she saw a sign that was asking for students to volunteer to the next day head out to this banquet hall to set up this big banquet for the school's new incoming president. And so when Whitney walked over to the table and asked the people what this was all about, she would learn that the majority of the people that had signed up to be volunteers so far were upperclassmen. And so as soon as she heard that, Whitney was quick to write her name down as well. The rest of the day would go completely as normal for Whitney. She would go to her classes, she would study, she would meet up with friends, and then eventually in the evening, she would make her way back to her dorm room where she would go to sleep. Little did she know, when she put her head down on the pillow that night, she was within 24 hours of her life changing in the most drastic way imaginable. The following morning, Whitney got up early, she took a shower, she brushed her teeth, and then she spent quite a while just staring at her wardrobe, debating which outfit she was going to wear, and then finally she chose the one she wanted and she got dressed. Whitney was not vain, but she knew the whole day would be spent around upperclassmen and university staff, and so she wanted to look her best. On her way towards her door to leave, Whitney would stop and look in her mirror one last time to make sure she looked okay, and in this fleeting moment, as she's looking herself up and down, she couldn't help but feel a justifiable sense of pride in this woman looking back at her. She had gotten into a great college, she had moved hundreds of miles from home and lived alone by herself for the first time, and her grades all year had been excellent. And so as Whitney's looking at herself, she thought to herself, you know what, I'm doing pretty good. Whitney's gaze would move from her reflection up to the clock on the wall and she would see she was running late. And so she quickly grabbed her jacket, she threw it over her shoulder and she went out the door. When Whitney arrived at the meeting spot in the parking lot nearby, she saw there was a group of what looked like students standing around a university van. And so Whitney walked up to them and sure enough, this was the group of volunteers. It consisted of seven other Taylor students, most of which were seniors and one university staff member. And so Whitney didn't know any of them. And so she quickly introduced herself. Everyone said hi. And then because Whitney was the last person they were waiting on, very quickly after she arrived, they were kind of ushered into the van. And then the van pulled out of the parking lot and began heading north towards Fort Wayne. Fort Wayne was where the banquet hall was. It was located about an hour north. At some point during this drive north, Whitney struck up a conversation with a 22-year-old senior named Laura Van Rin, who was sitting right next to her. Whitney and Laura were total strangers, but they looked so similar physically, they were both tall, blonde, and very slim, that when they first got onto the van, one of the other volunteers actually asked them if they were related. But it wasn't just physical similarities that Laura and Whitney shared. Once they got to talking, Whitney would learn that Laura had also grown up in a small rural Michigan town. It was called Caledonia, and it was located only a couple of hours south of Gaylord, where Whitney had grown up. After the van finally arrived in Fort Wayne, the volunteers got out, they went inside of the banquet hall building, and for the next several hours, they set up tables and chairs, they put out silverware, they hung up decorations, and the whole time, Laura and Whitney just stayed close together, continuing their friendly banter. And then around 7 p.m., when the banquet hall was ready for the next day's ceremony, the volunteers decided their work was done, and so they left the banquet hall building, they piled back into the van, and began heading south back towards their campus. For the first few minutes of the ride, Laura and Whitney would just continue to chat with each other, but pretty quickly they, like the rest of the people in the volunteer group, just were tired from all the hard work of moving things around, and so they became quiet and began looking out the window, just kind of keeping to themselves. About 30 minutes later, when the van was within a couple of miles of their campus, Whitney would turn and look next to her at Laura, just for a second, and right as she did, Laura would actually look up and look at Whitney, and so for a really quick second, 
they made eye contact, and so Whitney kind of awkwardly smiled at her. And as Laura was smiling back at Whitney, Whitney realized something very strange. There was this bright light on the side of Laura's face. And then seconds later, that bright light had grown, and the entire interior of the van was completely whited out. And then a second later, someone towards the front of the van yelled, Oh my God, no! And then the van went completely silent. But, but today, today's sponsor. Today's sponsor. Today's, today's sponsor. video is sponsored oh, by NordVPN. Oh, oh. You ever find yourself in Chocolaco, Alabama, looking out at a fresh murder of crows, and you think to yourself, man, I should get those crows some light fall weather jackets. And so you run home, you fire up your gasoline powered computer, you hop online to start searching for the perfect crow jacket, and then you get hit ah, with a PUA, a pop up ad. And you throw your hands up to protect yourself, bah! You're hit with another PUA, bah! And before long you're on the ground, you're calling out for your crow friends to come save you, but they're so chilly without their jackets, they can't flap their wings fast enough to get to you and so scared. <laughs> And so scared and alone on the ground, you die. This used to happen to me 5, 10, 60 times a week until I discovered NordVPN. A VPN or virtual private network. Hell, I got NordVPN, not gonna lie. <laughs> not gonna lie, W NordVPN for sure. Within minutes, dozens of 911 calls were coming in from motorists on I-69 saying that something terrible had happened. When first responders arrived on scene, they were braced for the worst, but even still, they were shocked at what they saw. Scattered all over the northbound and southbound lanes of I-69, not far from Taylor University, were all these huge chunks of jagged metal, there was glass everywhere, and there were bodies everywhere. That light that Whitney saw growing on Laura's face that suddenly filled the entirety of the van were the headlights of an 80,000 pound fully loaded tractor. That's why, I th that's why I thought it would happen. So let me, let me say this. Um, so is this what happened? Is that there was, cause I know these people be driving these big trucks and then they like drive for like long periods of times and stuff like that. So I'm, my question is, did they, was they driving and the dude fell asleep and Change lanes and ran them over. Is that what happened? I don't know. A truck driven by Robert Spencer. Robert was a truck driver and he was traveling north on I 69 when he fell asleep at the wheel. What I say, bro? At which point his truck veered off the road into the grassy median between the northbound side and the southbound side of I-69. His truck bounced up onto the southbound lane and crashed into Laura and Whitney's van and went Bro, he he fell he fell asleep and he went to a whole nother part. Cause you know it'd be like two different uhs. Like it'd be like coming this way and the whole one going this way. So this dude was coming this way, I think. And he drove, fell off, drove onto the grass part, came up and hit him on the other side, bro, with a truck, a eighty pound, eight thousand dollar pound truck, bro. Come on now. Lane and oh. crashed into Laura and Whitney's van, and when it did, the impact literally peeled off the side of their van and sent the van spinning. And so as the van is spinning, because of this huge opening in the side of it, the students inside were literally being violently thrown out of the van into traffic. When first responders finally actually began surveying the crash site, they would find Robert still in his truck, he was alive, but they would discover that of the nine occupants inside of that van, five were deceased. A few hours later, in the early morning hours of April 27th, Whitney Sarek's family back home in Gaylord, Michigan, woke up to the sound of a phone ringing. When one of Whitney's parents answered the phone, it was the Grant County coroner telling them their daughter had been in a terrible accident and she was deceased. At the same time, three hours south of Gaylord, Michigan in Caledonia, Michigan, the Van Rin family also was woken up in the middle of the night to a phone call, except the call they got was that their daughter, Laura, had been in that same crash, but she had survived, although she was in critical condition. In the days that followed, the Sarek family had Whitney's body transported to Gaylord, and then they began to plan for her funeral. A funeral that would have to be closed casket because of the extensive damage to Whitney's body. 
Meanwhile, Laura Van Rin's family rushed to Parkview Hospital in Fort Wayne, and they would find their daughter bandaged head to toe with a neck brace on, laying in a hospital bed in a coma. Doctors would tell Laura's family that even though Laura was now stable, there was no way of knowing if she would ever come out of that coma. And even if she did, she had suffered a serious brain injury, which likely would impact her ability to function. And so knowing that at best, this was going to be a very long road to recovery, Laura's family decided to move her from Fort Wayne back home to Michigan to a rehabilitation center in Grand Rapids that specialized in brain injury. And so while the Van Rins were in the process of moving Laura back to Michigan, the Sericks were in the process of saying their final goodbyes to Whitney. On April 29th, so three days after the accident, the Sereks would hold a visitation in their hometown of Gaylord. A visitation is a time for friends and acquaintances to come together and pay respects and offer condolences to the people that the deceased have left behind. For Whitney's visitation, more than 1,400 people attended, which was nearly half of Gaylord's total population. Dang. The following day, on April 30th, Whitney was buried. At the same time, 1987, 2006, so she was like 20 something. She was like, she was like 20, hold on, let me see, 1987 minus, oh, not, minus 2006. Wait, 19? She was 19, she was 19 years old? No way, right? 19. She was 19, bro. Oh my God, that's so tough, bro. RIP, bro. Laura's family, who had been taking turns keeping a 24-hour bedside vigil with Laura in the Grand Rapids facility, were given some incredible news. Based on brain scans, it looked very much like Laura would wake up from her coma, although there was no timeline. Over the next couple of weeks, Laura remained comatose, but her body would slowly begin to heal and all signs seemed to be pointing towards her eventually making a recovery. And then on Tuesday, May 16th, so 20 days after the accident, Laura woke up from her coma. And amazingly, at first, it seemed like her brain was functioning the way it should be. The family could not believe their luck. This was a miracle. Over the next few days, Laura would slowly regain her strength to the point where she could move some limbs and she could sit up in her bed. And then as for her cognitive function, it seemed like she was making strides, but then she would do something that would make doctors and her family and everybody around her start to question if her brain really was okay. On Monday, May 22nd, so one week after Laura had woken up from her coma, she was sitting in her hospital bed with her physical therapist right next to her and her family was in the room as well. And at some point, her physical therapist handed Laura a pencil and then she put a pad of paper in front of her. And then the therapist told Laura to write a word down that was very specific. It was a word that Laura should know well and a word that Laura should be able to spell. And so after Laura kind of gave a nod saying, Was it her name? Was it her name? I think it's her name. She understood the assignment. Laura took the pencil and very awkwardly and painstakingly wrote out a word. But when she was done and the therapist looked at what she had written, it was wrong. It didn't make any sense. And so she asked Laura to do it again. And so Laura, with even more determination, would try to write this word. And once again, she wrote the same word, the same incorrect word. And so it was at this point that the therapist and the onlooking family started to realize that, you know, her injury to her brain might be more extensive than we thought. However, as everyone in that room would soon find out, that was not the case. There was something much, much bigger going on. Back on April 26th, just minutes after the car accident, first responders began moving about the crash site to figure out who was deceased and who was still alive. When they found Laura, she was barely clinging to life on the side of the road, and so they rushed over to her, they put her on a stretcher along with her purse, which contained her driver's license, they put that all together, they put her on an ambulance, and they sent her to the hospital. Once Laura arrived at the hospital, doctors would use her driver's license inside of her purse to identify her, and then they began wrapping her head to toe in bandages and casts. And when bandages began coming off over the following weeks, it was immediately obvious to everyone 
anyone that this accident had significantly altered Laura's physical appearance, most notably her teeth. They almost looked like they had been shifted to one side in her mouth. However, oh. to Laura's family, they didn't care how she looked. They only cared that she was still alive. But on Monday, May 22nd, when Laura was handed that piece of paper and a pencil, and she was told to write her name, she did not write L. See, I told you her name. I, I knew it. I knew it because it's the only thing, like, that's the only, like, Pacific name. Like, you know what I'm saying? If somebody asks you, or they, your birthday or something like that, or, like, your favorite. No, not your favorite color. No, no, because you could put anything. Yeah, so, like, your birthday or your name, something that's, like, everyone knows it and it has to be this exact thing like it's the only thing it could be a u r a laura she wrote w h i t whitney <gasps> whitney what it would turn out a colossal mistake was made and nobody caught it until that moment bro it's no way bro they mistaken the two they say they look they say they look they look the same it's no way bro so they buried the other girl with the wrong casket. Everybody else came to uh, the wrong funeral. Oh, and was remember it was a closed casket. They couldn't even look at her. Oh my god, that is crazy. That's crazy, bro. The wrong because he had to look. Think about it. So say like, okay, how can y'all not see? Because they went to a funeral. How y'all not know? It's a closed casket, so you can't see. You literally can't see him because the damage is so bad. So literally, what a high else are you gonna tell? If the only people that can look at it, it was the the uh, the morgue people and the um the paramedics. You know what I'm saying? I don't think the family even see it. I don't think they even see it. So like, bro, literally, this it's easy. Especially if y'all look the same too, and if y'all both like damaged, it's like hard to tell. Like y'all both literally. The woman sitting in the hospital bed with the pencil and paper wow. was not 22 year old Laura Van Rin. The woman sitting in the hospital bed was 18 year old Whitney Sarek. When Whitney was found on the side of the road clinging to life, the first responders thought the purse next to her was hers. And so they opened it up, they found a oh, driver's wow. license, they looked at it, and they looked at the victim on the ground, and they looked identical. And so they said, okay, this is Laura. And amazingly, Whitney's purse that contained her driver's license happened to land on the ground next to Laura's body. And so Laura was misidentified as Whitney Sarek. A week after Whitney had written her name down on that pad of paper, it was officially confirmed that this was a case of mistaken identity. And so once again, the Sarek family received a call in the middle of the night from the Grant County coroner. Except this time, they were telling- Wait a minute, so that makes the soil away, so that is even weirder. Cause if you think about it, so that means that they was literally talking to the daughter and all this stuff, and it's literally not even their daughter. That's not their parents. She probably didn't know who was in the hospital. They thought it's her family. It's a whole different family that she in there with. She probably even she probably going even more crazy because you know when you like in critical condition condition and stuff like that, you see uh somebody that you know that you love a lot, or you hear a song or something like that. It makes you it makes you feel better. You know what I'm saying? So like she's seeing people she don't know. He, she maybe she still her her brain not automatically auto already working. Automat I don't know if I want to say automatically, but you know what I'm trying to say. Her brain not working to the fullest. So she probably scared. Like, who is these people? You know what I'm saying? They surrounded me. Like, you know what I mean? Like, dang, that's tough, bro. She lived with the wrong family. Like, think about that. She was there with the wrong family. ...them that your daughter did not die in that car accident. She's alive. She's in Grand Rapids waiting for you. And so the Sarek family, they were completely shocked. They wanted this to be true, but it just seemed too good to be true. They had had a funeral for Whitney. They had buried Whitney, except because it was closed casket, Can't they never it. saw Whitney. Thank and you. And so the Sarek's hopped in a plane. What I say, bro? What I say? Look, look, I'm, look, bro, Mr. Ball, you need me on here. <laughs> He need me over here, yo. Somebody give Mr. Ball me. Come on, bro. They flew to Grand Rapids, and they walked into that hospital room, and there on the hospital bed was their daughter, Whitney, with her arms Dang. outstretched, crying, calling for her parents. While this, of course, was a miracle for the Sereks, it was, family. at the same time, yep. a complete nightmare for the Van Rins. They had had their suspicions that something was off about their daughter, most notably her teeth, because they just didn't look like their daughter's teeth. But they had been told by the doctors and by anybody who would talk to them that it was perfectly normal for people involved in these very significant accidents to look completely different or even act completely different. And so the Van Rins just kind of put their suspicions to the side and focused on looking after their 
their child and helping her recover. A few days later, Laura Van Rin's body, which had been buried in Gaylord, Michigan, under the tombstone that said Whitney Sarek, was exhumed and her body was flown to Caledonia, where the Van Rin family was able to give their daughter a proper funeral and burial. Even though Whitney and Laura had only known each other very briefly during that volunteer event in Fort Wayne, their families would forge a bond over this shared trauma. And in 2008, two years after the crash, the Serex and the Van Rins would co-author a book about their experience in going through this horrible event from each of their perspectives. That book is called Mistaken Identity, Two Families, One Survivor, Unwavering Hope. Also that year, on April 26th, so the second anniversary of the accident, Taylor University would dedicate a prayer chapel to the five victims. Since the crash, Indiana has changed their state's protocols and procedures for identifying accident victims to ensure this type of mix-up can never happen again. As for Robert Spencer, the truck driver who caused the fatal accident, he would be sentenced to four years in prison. And let me know in the comments, y'all think he need more? Y'all think he need more? Ah, he, do y'all think that he need more time? Now, me personally, I ain't gonna lie. I feel like... I feel like it's, it's I feel like it's kind of everybody fault because you gotta think about it. So like, the truck drivers, yes, you know what you're getting yourself into. You're being a truck driver. You know you're gonna be driving for long hours. You know you're gonna be end up feeling sleepy. You know what I'm saying? So it's his fault for that. You know what I'm saying? We're take not taking proper precautions. I don't know what you gotta do to stay up. Whatever. Then number two is the people who even doing this stuff. You know what I'm saying? You having these people drive ten hours, twelve hours, twenty hours. You know what I'm saying? You expecting people to just, like, they're not robots. It's not robots. People get tired. People get distracted. It just shit happens. You know what I'm saying? So, like, I don't know, bro. He fell asleep. It's tough. But, hey, I love y'all. We out.